Well, welcome to Sunset Hills Baptist Church. It's another weekend, it's another Sunday, or it could be Saturday or Monday or whenever you choose to watch this. We want you to know that we're happy you're here and we look forward to worshiping together as we, uh, as we have been doing these past many weeks. But this time is gonna be coming to a point where we can actually worship together again. We will still uh, be doing an online service. We'll still be doing the devotional moments that we've been putting up on Facebook. But we want to let you know that we look forward to our people being able to come back here and worshiping with us at the church building. Not because we're in a building, but because we'll be together again. A couple things. Number one, June 7th is when we will be coming back to do this. That's pretty much a set in stone date at this point, unless Jesus comes back and then, you know, it really won't matter at that point. Uh, but the other thing is, is we are watching and we're learning about all of the new hygiene rules that we must follow. And we want to make sure that when you do come back, you feel safe and comfortable coming back. May God bless you and may you enjoy the service this weekend. Take care. The love of God is greater far than pen or tongue can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his hand. came from Romans 12 verses 1 and 2 and Philippians 3 7 through 14. But everything that was a gain to me I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this church, this service, Father God, that we will be partaking in this morning. Father God, I ask that you will touch each and every individual that's listening this morning, that you will continue to shield and protect them, that you grant them, Father, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to be aware of their surroundings and what's going on around us at this time. I bring this church family completely to you, asking that you will continue to show them with your blessings, that you will continue to protect them and watch over them. And they're going out and they're coming in, Father God, and that each need will be met. Healing will come to their bodies, Father God. Love will come into their life. And that we could be a complete and helpful and happy family in the church body that we attend. Mm -hmm. I ask you, God, that you would let your anointing touch each and every member and that you will continue to protect and watch over them as they go their ways during the week. In Jesus' name, amen. Fathers, we go from day to day. We see the confusion that is amiss us and the devil, he's really busy and at work. But we should understand that once we put our faith in you and not faith in man, because man seems to be going in various directions and they don't even know where they're going, but let us put our faith in you. And remember that we have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll, fastened to a rock, which is you, Lord, that cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. Father, bless this church and bless all those who will be watching the service this weekend. Bless Pastor Jim and bless Brother Wilshire. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Only the dictator of the Roman Republic for five years, Gaius Julius Caesar, died 15 March 44 B.C. Uh, sometimes some of, you, some of us may have come across the term the Ides of March. Well, this is where that phrase comes from. Uh, he died uttering the famous Latin phrase, E tu, Brute? And he said that to his supposed friend Brutus, who, with another group of senators, stabbed Julius Caesar to death in the, out, just outside the Roman Senate. Julius Caesar is known for his many exploits, yet I don't know of anybody that has ever attributed humility to Caesar. After achieving a quick military victory against an enemy, which the battle took place in what is now Turkey, Caesar expressed to a Senate friend of his in a letter, Vini, Vini, Vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. Now, if you really consider everything that we've been facing as a nation, these three Latin words, which are just dripping with, an, with the arrogance of a Julius Caesar, they're really not very appropriate now in what we've been going through over the past couple months. Our current situation doesn't seem to manifest anything that resembles bravado. Our society in America right now, we're being controlled by fear, albeit 
on seemingly opposite ends of the spectrum. On the one end, there's the fear over those things that we cannot see, specifically a virus that could kill us. Now, on the other end of this spectrum, we also see fear. Yet, yet on this end of the spectrum, it's fear of what we can see, specifically like the government or politicians or the media. It is this undercurrent of fear which should cause believers in Jesus Christ to be able to stand out in our culture. Uh, Those who are commanded to live by faith must stand in direct contrast to this this inclination, this natural uh, slide into fear. Believers in Jesus Christ must pay attention here. We are called to be different from those who are not part of God's kingdom. We're not to look like the world. We're not to act like the world. We are not to be like the world. We, as, a, as an entity, as the body of Christ, as the church, as, as that which is all of those who know Jesus Christ as our Lord, Lord and Savior, we are to be countercultural. The child of God must live by and through faith. And this is what Jesus said is completely opposite of fear in his Olivet Discourse. So, is it sin for a Christian to be affected by the events and circumstances of this world? I don't believe so. Yet, and this is an important distinction, the believer in Jesus Christ should never be controlled by the events and the circumstances of this world. See, we serve a God who is, who came, and he conquered death. And and death is the greatest of all human fears. Should not this fact fill us with an incredible peace and an incredible confidence that the rest of the world should be able to easily see? In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, we find the opening paragraph to the prologue of the Gospel of John. Now, we've just finished with our study of John, which I looked back in my notes. I began this study, and this church began this study in June 2018. Now, the reason why I wanted to end with the beginning is is for this reason. See, the Apostle John wrote this gospel at the end of his life. Yet, John did not begin his gospel about Jesus Christ our Lord with the birth of Jesus. John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, begins his account before there even was a beginning in eternity. Now, I want you to follow along as I read these five short verses in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The writer of Matthew chose to demonstrate to the Jews the lineage of Jesus Christ, and he started with Abraham, the father of all of Israel. Mark began with the one who proclaimed the arrival of the Messiah Jesus, who was John the Baptist. And since the writer of the Gospel of Luke was actually a doctor of medicine, his Gospel demonstrated the person of Jesus Christ, not merely through the lineage of just the husband Joseph, but also through the mother Mary, all the way back to King David. And and by the way, for the Jewish audience uh, who reveled in detail and the idea of legitimacy, this would have been particularly appealing to them. 
Yet look at John's opening here in verse 1. Under the inspiration of God, John is not demonstrating Christ's legitimacy, nor his genealogy, but rather his deity. John doesn't begin with a birth or a lineage, but he chooses to begin with eternity. Echoing the opening of Genesis, John writes, In the beginning was the Word. Now, in these opening five verses, John uses the Greek concept of logos. Now, this is translated uh, as, as word. Um, uh, we've all used pencils. Uh, but in English, they're a pencil. In German, they're schreiben. But it's still a pencil. Well, this is the idea behind the Greek understanding of what logos is. Now, it literally can mean word, the spoken word. But... In Greek thought, in their philosophy, it has more of a statement of, of the base meaning of everything. The meaning of the Logos in the Greek thought is, is a basis of reality, of the everything, which is core to the understanding of what the Greeks would say is reality. John also uses life and light for the person of Jesus Christ, and he uses the metaphor of darkness to describe the world outside of God's kingdom and all that is under Satan's control. We see all of these themes throughout the book of John, and that's what we've, we've finished studying. And I realize that many of you that are watching this now, you, you weren't here for that. Uh, but, but because of this situation, God and his sovereign plan, this is what we do now. We are now online. And so it's my heart's desire to be able to explain to the best of my ability what God's word means. In, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus Christ identifies himself as, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Uh, the, the, the Greek word is super, super cool. Now, I realize that my geekiness is showing up some, but the Greek word for almighty is super cool. It is pantocrator. It has that, it, it has that sense of, uh, you know, not only onomatopoeia, you know, it, it sounds like what it means, but it has that, that, that muscle memory, that kinesthetic sense about it. Pantocrator, it, it, means, it means the almighty. It means literally the all-powerful, the ruler of all. The term, by the way, almighty is only used of God in Scripture. Now, John finishes his thought in verse 1, declaring that the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. In verse 2, the context allows us to understand that he, the Logos, Jesus Christ, was in the beginning with God. And it was a reference, the, the God there, with God, is a reference to the Father, and this was as the Jews would understand it, and he was the God that the Logos was with in eternity, and the Logos was God. What John was preparing his readers to understand is that this Messiah, the God who is from the beginning, is the subject of his whole gospel. And that's how he starts this. And that's how we'll be ending it. We have just studied in John chapter 20 and verse 21 that John's purpose in focusing on Christ and demonstrating that he is God everlasting is that those who read and understand may, and this is important, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And that's a direct quote from John chapter 20, verse 31. In verse 3, John states that the one who is the Logos, who is God, and who dwelled with God the Father, is the one who created what we would refer to as reality, as all that is. I, I've mentioned many, many times before, because I find it's the most coolest concept in Scripture, in Colossians chapter 1, where, where Paul goes on and he goes through this, this description of who Jesus Christ is. And what he's saying is, if it was not for the existence of Jesus Christ, what is would not be. I, I, I know it sounds like I'm 
you know, keep repeating, but it, it, bears, it bears repeating. Science tells us that in these very walls in this room, there, are, there is more empty space than there is solid. And, and we understand, I, I realize I am not a, a physicist. I, I like phys- physics, but I'm not a physicist. I'm certainly not anybody that, that understands quantum mechanics beyond just a superficial sense. But there is something that holds what is there together here. And that person is Jesus Christ. John goes further in the ending of the phrase in verse 3, that if Christ did not exist, then without him was not anything made that was made. In other words, if Jesus didn't make it, it wasn't made. I mean, you think about that. You know, sometimes we'll see things that it's lab created or it's man created or I created. You know, we, we hear this all the time in the scientific com- community. But it, it goes back to the old, you know, the old joke about, about you got Satan and Jesus. And, and Satan says, you know, well, I can, I can make a man just like you can. And Jesus is just looking at him. And, and, and Satan, uh, you know, bends down. He gets, gets ready to grab up some dirt. And Jesus goes, uh-uh. You get your own dirt. See, everything that man creates, he creates from something that already is. John here is saying that everything that is, Christ created. The was made, and this is important for those of us like me that are word geeks and, and, and things, but this is important for our understanding of the, with the inspiration of the Bible. God put things in the Bible for his purposes and the way It is, is exactly how God wanted it to be. Was made is in the perfect tense in the Greek. When the second person of the Godhead, the person that would eventually become Jesus, when he made everything, he completed, he made, and he finished creation which had no need of further evolution. In other words, he delivered finished creation complete. There was no need of evolving. I'm not really ready here to go into a lecture or, or even a, a dissertation or any type of uh, in-depth uh, argument regarding how evolution is vastly inferior to biblical creationism. But if we understand Scripture, there's really no need for evolution. It's like, oh, sure, there's, there's going to be, you can get different breeds of animals. You can get different types of animals. But... A dog did not come from slime. It came from a dog. When the world was created, it was created complete, and it was finished. And, and you say, well, well, you're just stating that. No, no, look, there are parallels throughout Scripture. See, all world religions have some truth in them, some truth, but yet they're mixed with vast amounts of lies. If you study the book of Malachi, which is the last book in the Old Testament, God makes it very clear. Anytime you mix something that is pure with something that is not, it is an abomination to God. If you take truth and if you mix it with error, it becomes abomination. And see, that's what the world religions have come. They all speak somewhat of truth, but then they speak so much lie into that truth that the truth loses its truthness. And so, what God is trying to get us to understand is that there's this this parallelism. When God created creation, when Jesus Christ, who created man and created the world, as Genesis says, in seven days, six days, and he rested on the seventh, when he created this world, it was finished. But think about the parallel here. When Jesus Christ completed his mission on this earth and he died on that Roman cross he uttered the word the words it is finished there was nothing else we had to do we don't have to be baptized to be saved we don't have to walk on our knees on broken glass to be saved we do not have to give up anything to be saved because if we do then that means Jesus Christ did not finish what he did Paul enunciates this truth again. I just mentioned earlier Colossians chapter 1 about how Christ 
he holds everything together. The writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 states that Jesus is literally uh, the last word to mankind. Uh, I, I didn't show it on the screen right now, but I think it's worthy to be looked at. Jesus is the ultimate truth. Even John records in John chapter 14 verse 6 where Jesus tells his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by Him. Paul, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 5, writes this, For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. This statement is important because what it does, it's about who we are in Jesus Christ. We are of the light. And that brings us to the only point that we're going to look at today, and it's this. His light is our life. And we see this very clearly in verses 1 to 5 in this first chapter of John. Without Jesus Christ, without the incarnation, when God came into a very dark world to a manger as a helpless child in Bethlehem, we would never know, we being humans, would never know the light who is God. Humanity would have been unable to know what truth is without seeing and experiencing the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus told his disciples over and again, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Again, while the Spirit of God was inspiring John what to include in the gospel, John used his spirit-empowered knowledge to be able to tie all of these metaphors together. Christ was life, and that life was the light of men in verse 4. All that we would dare label as life comes from the person of Jesus Christ. He was the original person that created all. The transitory events, you know, uh, what we would call uh, life, The transitory events which occur between our birth and our death. Yet, when we try to look at those, and and, and look, life is enjoyable. God created it to be such. He gave us the ability to enjoy this world. But yet, when we compare that to the life which is eternal and which will be spent in the presence of God, what is this time compared to eternity? We're created to live forever somewhere. I mean, you know, every single human being, whether they know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior or whether they do not, they will live somewhere forever. The Bible does not teach annihilationalism. It doesn't teach that after you die, well, you're just gone. That's not what it teach. It does not teach that. John closes this opening thought in his prologue with this simple yet, yet, yet almost relentless truth. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it in verse 5. You know, even our observational uh, knowledge of light. Um, I had a professor in seminary who said what the Bible is, it's, it's a book of, of, uh, of, of observational truth or observational phenomena. But our knowledge of light allows us to understand that no matter how deep the darkness, no matter how far darkness extends, light always shines in the darkness. You know, we we get out flashlights of different intensity. We may shine it into the dark, and you say, well, it's, it's just not, what, strong enough. It's not that it's not light enough, it's just not strong enough. I mean, you get close to something, you can see perfectly fine with the light that you have, but for it to extend, it needs to be a much more powerful light. There is no darkness which can overcome light. The sources of light, uh, we know, has limits. But within those limits, light can and will always penetrate what we would what, you know, metaphorically or or poetically, I think would be more accurate, uh, you know, penetrate the dominion where the darkness resides. The New International Version of of, of, of the Bible uses the phrase, but darkness has not understood it. 
John's use of light as a metaphor for God and his kingdom will certainly allow for this reading. That's a, that, that's a reasonably good, good reading. It's a, it's a very good reading. That the darkness did not understand it. Uh, Jesus again and again throughout his, throughout his life, even on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them because they, what? They know not what they do. Yet the context is more clearly understood using the words in the ESV, the version that I'm using for you, and the darkness has not overcome it. See, this allows us to gain greater understanding and even a greater faith in the God who is, who came and who conquered. I'm certain that at that moment when Jesus was on the cross and he uttered, it is finished and then died, there probably was a moment that Satan may have exulted in his assumed victory over Christ's death. Yet, just a mere three days later, when Jesus rose from the grave, that glee that Satan initially had probably became the most absolute horror that we could ever imagine. Now, 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 now think about this. Satan knows Scripture. He quoted Scripture to Christ, albeit he took it out of context, but he knows what's in the Scriptures. He knew it was foretold that the Messiah would rise again. Yet, what would enable someone with such a knowledge of prophecy to still act like he won, and yet he knows what the Bible says? And it's, it, it, what enables that? Well, it's the same thing that enables when we see humanity today again and again, over and over, humanity strives to ignore the commands and the created order of God. And, and they try to flaunt and they try to chart their own course. Why? Hubris. Unmitigated arrogance on a scale which we can barely imagine. What makes this possible is the continued presence of sin. Sin which is corrupting demoralizing and sin which destroys the ability to understand what truth is that's exactly what paul writes about in romans chapter one what he said but you know where he talks about how that 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 humanity they they knew the truth of god but they chose instead to believe a lie the editor of the bible knowledge commentary stated that in verse 5, John summarized his gospel record. Light will invade the dominion of darkness. Satan and his subjects will resist the light, but will not be able to overcome its presence and power. And finally, the word, the logos, Jesus Christ, will be victorious in spite of opposition. See, Jesus Christ is life. And I think if any time we needed to be reminded of that, this is the time. He is life for the believer. No matter what crisis we may face now, just be sure to understand that, guess what? There's going to be another crisis. Yet for those of us who have a relationship with God and His Son Christ, who ensures our eternal destiny with God, it, it, it really doesn't matter what happens in this world. We'll, we'll bemoan it. It'll be inconvenient uncomfortable, could even harm us to a degree. Do we desire to suffer and face physical pain? No, no, no sane person does. Yet the believer in Christ understands what life is. We know that there is something beyond this life. All you have to do is go to a funeral. You look around at people who, none of the people in that funeral that love the person that died, none of them are happy about the new car they have or the new clothes or the big house. They'd rather have the life. And if, and if it was truly just people died and that was it, then why do we mourn life so much? It's like, oh, well, you know, because they were here and we loved it. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but why is it that we seek more time? Why is it that we can constantly yearn to have more time? Because there is something in us that longs for the eternal. We know there's something beyond this life. We've been promised that this is practice for us. What we call life, it's practice for heaven. 
There's going to come a time where everything that we've learned, everything that we've understand, we're going to be able to put to use for eternity with God. We serve a God who cannot be surprised by a disease, a virus, a bad economy, or a corrupt government. For our God, who is everything, is now. There are no surprises since he has existed from the beginning, as he, and he is even now waiting for us at the end. That's going to probably just drive one of my professors in seminary right over the edge. I, I'm very sorry, and I somewhat meaningfully apologize, but not really, you know. I passed. <laughs> we may have an itch to know what is coming, but here's the thing. We're really not made to know what's in the future. We are made to know the person who does know what's in the future. See, it is beyond my ability to design a lesson which will positively turn people toward Jesus Christ. Only God the Father can do that. I can't f cause people to come to Christ. I can't even force them. Yet if you have realized that you do not know God, you do not have a relationship with the one who is, who was, and who will always be, and who is coming again, know that all of you who find themselves in that position, well, the first thing you have to do is you have to repent of your sin. Jesus said very clearly that no man can come to the Father unless the Father draws them to me. If God draws you to him, he will also make you very much aware of your sin. You need to ask to be saved. And then you'll be able to know the God of eternity. But see, if we don't repent, we won't know that we're saved because there'll be no evidence. And if we don't ask, we cannot have because there's no desire. He will also give you Jesus Christ and God the Father an ever-growing ability to understand that Christ has conquered everything. And we have been given the faith to believe him. In the midst of all that we face in this world, in the midst of all of the problems that we face, the difficulties, the scare tactics, the real news, fake news, bad news, good news, we can know Jesus Christ and we can overcome. Because the darkness has not overcome the light and that light is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask that you would take your word and you implant it into the, the listener's heart as only you can. Father, you, you create within us a desire to know you more. A desire to, to hear from you. We don't have to become weird. We just have to become yours. Father, you give us that desire. Father, there's some people out there that have had real struggles through this crisis that we're in as a country. Father, you allow them to know that you're in charge of their life, that you know exactly where they are. There are other people, Father, that have lost people during this time. You are the God of comfort. You are the God of peace. And Father, there could be somebody out there that they've realized that they really do not have a relationship with you. And now they want one. Father, you cause them to know exactly what they must do. Let them search your word. Let them understand that we must understand that we're sinners. We must be sorry for that sin and not just feel bad, but, Father, turn from it, have a desire to leave it behind. And we must ask you to save us. And your word says, for all, everyone who call upon the name of the Lord to be saved will be saved. Father, to God, you, your Son, and your Spirit, be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless, and you have a great week.
I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice as it told thy love for me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. There are depths of love that I cannot know Till I cross that narrow sea There are heights of joy that I may not reach Till I rest in peace with Thee Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to your service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding. Beloved, thank you for being here this week. Remember the words of James chapter 1. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. God bless you. We'll see you next week.